everybody get our Bibles and let's turn to Revelation chapter 22 and verse 17. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 17. And what we have here in the Word of God is uh, the last invitation to salvation in the Bible and in the Word of God. The very last invitation in the Bible for people to come to Christ and uh, receive Him as Savior. Now, uh, it's Revelation chapter 22 and verse 15. So let's everybody get our Bibles and let's turn to Revelation chapter 22 and verse 15. Uh, for without our dogs... And now let's look down at verse 17, because in verse 17, what we have here is the last invitation in the Bible, the very last invitation. Revelation 22 and verse 17. Let's read it together. And the Spirit... Amen. Let's read it through one more time. Revelation 22 and verse uh, 17. Let's read it together. And the Spirit and the Christ say, Come. And let him that hears say, Come. And let him that is the first come. And whosoever will let him bring the Lord of life freely. Amen. You may be seated. And as we're studying the Word of God for uh, the last uh, few Sundays about what the Bible teaches about heaven, what uh, uh, the Bible teaches about hell, and as we study uh, uh, the Word of God. Now, last week we were looking at Revelation chapter uh, 21 and verse 8. Now, that was what we were looking at last Sunday morning, and that tells us very clearly. Now, you see, in Revelation chapter 21, what you have here in the Word of God is the most detailed description in all of the Bible about heaven. See, there's no more detailed description about heaven in all the Bible than in Revelation chapter 21. Now, we pointed out um, uh, uh, in previous studies the several things we learned there about heaven in Revelation 22, 21 and verses 1 through 7. But now, last week, what we were looking at was uh, those who the Bible specifically says will not go to heaven. The Bible does not teach that everybody is on their way to heaven, that everybody will go to heaven. See, Revelation 21 and verse 8, and the Bible says, But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second uh, death. Now, what we want to point out very clearly from the Word of God before we move on to some other things this morning is that all of those people that you read about in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8 say all of those people could have been saved. Now, in other words, they did not have to go to hell. Now, the reason why the Bible says here very, very clearly that they're going to hell is uh, because they did not repent. They did not repent and come to Christ as uh, a Savior. For instance, turn to Revelation chapter 9 and verse 21. Now, in Revelation chapter 9, and we read here in verse uh, 21, uh, it says, Neither repented they of their murders. Now, in other words, see, the reason why the Bible teaches a murderer goes to hell is not because they were a murderer, but they never repented of their murder. See what it says in Revelation 9 and verse 21. Neither repented they of their mur murders, nor of their sorcerers, uh, sorceries, or of their fornication, nor of their thefts. No, see, and that is why the Bible teaches they'll wind up in the lake of fire, the second death, and eternal hell. Now, what does the Bible say here? Say, because they repented not. That's as clear as clear 
uh, can be. Now, if you turn over to Revelation chapter 16 and uh, verse 11, the Bible says, and they blasphemed the God of heaven. See, they blasphemed God. It's possible to blaspheme God. A lot of blasphemers of God in our society today. Now, in uh, Revelation 16 and verse 11, and they blaspheme the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. And the Bible says, they repented not of their deeds. See, and the reason why people are lost is because they would not repent of their sins. What's the Bible teaching there? They did not realize they were sinners and they're not willing to repent or turn from their uh, sins. Now, as we go uh, back to the last chapter in uh, the Bible and the last chapter in the book of the Revelation and Revelation chapter uh, 22 and verse 17. And what we have here, see, is the last invitation in the Bible. What you have here in the Word of God is God's last call to people to be saved. It is God's last call for people to come to know Jesus as their uh, Savior. So let's look at it in Revelation chapter 22 and uh, verse 17. And the Bible says, and the Spirit, you see, and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life uh, freely. So what we have here is a last invitation in the Bible, God's last invitation for people to come to the water of life, another way of looking at the salvation that Jesus Christ affords them. Now, the Bible says here in verse 17, and the Spirit say, come. Now, we, as we study the Word of God, the Bible is very, very clear that uh, one of the great ministries of the Holy Spirit of God is to encourage people to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, before anybody can get saved, they have to be convicted by the Holy Spirit of God. Now, we read in the Gospel of John very, very clearly that one of the great ministries of the Holy Spirit is that He will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. But now, uh, the point there is that is the ministry of the Holy Spirit and who does he convict? The Bible says the world. And so I believe that the Holy Spirit of God deals with every unsaved person. And uh, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to encourage them to come to Christ as their personal uh, a Savior. And then the Bible says in verse 17, And the bride say, Come. And there, I believe the bride is referring to the local church. And uh, the ministry of the church is always to reach out to the unsaved. It's always to preach the gospel and to encourage people to be saved and come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal uh, Savior. Now, just like everybody here uh, this morning, you're saved. You know the Lord as your Savior. If you are saved, say you have a burden for others to come to the Lord. And uh, we all ought to be inviting the lost to come uh, to Jesus. Now, then we read in verse 17, uh, the Bible uh, says, And let him that heareth say, Come. Now, that's probably referring to those that are hearing the book of the Revelation. And those that uh, were in the, the local churches, they heard uh, the Word of God, hear the book of the Revelation. So everybody that hears the Word of God ought to have a desire for people to be saved and people to come to know Christ as their own personal uh, uh, Savior. And then in verse 17, the Bible is very uh, uh, clear. The Bible says, And him that is a thirst, come. Now, what's that talking about? Say, people who are... Um, have nothing, people who are uh, in life and they have no purpose, they have no meaning, they're in uh, despair, they have never found satisfaction in life, no matter who they are. You see, the Bible reaches out 
And it says here in verse 17, and let him that is a thirst come. Now, the interesting thing that all these words here for come are imperatives in the Word of God. They actually are imperatives of entreaty. Now, you say, Pastor, what, what is that all about? And what does that mean? In other words, see, these are commands. See, God is commanding every person to come to Jesus Christ as their personal uh, Savior. But now, it is also an entreaty, which uh, simply means that, see, the Lord cannot force anybody to be saved. See, if somebody is going to be saved, they have to come of their own volition and receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. So that's very, very interesting. Like we read in Acts 17 and verse 30, God has commanded all men everywhere to repent, Acts 17, 30, and verse uh, 31. Now, you see, all of these words here, the word come, say, are commands. See, God is commanding. Every unsaved person is under the command of God to come to the water of life, salvation in uh, the Lord uh, uh, Jesus uh, uh, Christ. Now, and uh, the verse goes on, and it says, let him that is a thirst come. Now, in other words, see, uh, that, that person uh, who is searching, that person who has never found satisfaction in life, that they've tried everything. You see, uh, a thirsty person, let him come and drink of the water uh, of life. And then the Bible says, and whosoever will. That's a very interesting phrase in the Bible. See, now, who does God's invitation for salvation reach out to? The Bible says, whosoever will. You see, it's for whosoever. That invitation is for everybody and anybody. See, whosoever uh, will. Now, that's a verse in the Bible that the Calvinists do not like. They don't like that verse. See, whosoever will may come. By the way, uh, the elect are the whosoevers that do come, and the non-elect are the whosoevers that do not come. See, this is a valid invitation for every person. You see, uh, whosoever will. Anybody who desires salvation can find salvation according to the Word of God. See, it's whosoever will. See, you never have to worry, does God love me? Does God want to save me? Did Jesus Christ die for me? Of course He did, no question about that. It's for whosoever uh, will. And then the Bible uh, says here, whosoever will, which simply means that anybody who has a desire to be saved can be saved. Now, as you think about it, and as you study the Word of God, say, that's the only person that can be saved. Amen? See, if you don't have a desire to be saved, you don't want to be saved, so you can never be saved. In other words, say, God cannot save anybody apart from their will, or apart from their desire to be saved. Now, uh, as we already read it, see, they blaspheme God. They repented not of their deeds, see, and uh, they didn't have any desire for salvation. But anybody who wants to be saved can be uh, uh, saved. Now, the beautiful thing here, take of the water of life, and that's another way to look at the salvation that Jesus offers. See, he quenches our uh, thirst, and it's a water that leads to everlasting uh, life. Now, but it's interesting, as you look at verse 17, the last word in verse 17 is that uh, whosoever will let him take the water of life freely. Now, what does that mean? See, salvation is a free gift. Nobody has to pay for it. There's nothing that I can do to merit it. It is free. Uh, the Bible says the gift of God is eternal life through the Lord Jesus uh, Christ. Now, say that's God's message to man. Now, that's the last invitation in the Bible that we read about in the Word of God. Say, um, uh, let him that 
uh, the, and the spirit and the bride say come, let him that heareth say come, and uh, let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will see, let him take of the water of life uh, freely. Now, um, that is God's message of salvation. Now, you see, God is always reaching out to the unsaved. Now, if you're here this morning and you're unsaved, you don't know the Lord as your Savior, say God is reaching out to you. God wants you to be saved. The Holy Spirit is convicting you and showing you that you need to be uh, saved. All of God's children, if you're unsaved, are praying that you would come to know Jesus Christ as your personal uh, uh, Savior. So, you see, that's God's message to man. And it's always a, man, uh, a message to say, come to Jesus. Come to the Son of God. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn away from your sin and turn to Jesus Christ as your personal uh, uh, Savior. Say, and what a beautiful invitation that is. What a, a wonderful message you have. What a, a wonderful message I have as the children of God is that if you want to be saved, come to Jesus. And that's the only way to be saved. So you must come to Jesus Christ, not to the pastor, not to the church, not to my friends, uh, not that I have to give money or uh, go to the baptismal tank or uh, be a member of a certain church or uh, confess my sins to a priest, nothing like that uh, at all. See, it's a matter we must come to Jesus. Salvation is 100% Jesus Christ. I must come to Jesus to be saved. Now, somebody says, well, uh, I believe I need to come to Jesus and do this. I must come to Jesus and do something else. Now, whenever anybody says you need to come to Jesus and do something else, you know they're a heretic and they're not following the Bible. Why? Because it's not Jesus and it's Jesus alone. Amen? See, it's not Jesus and something else or somebody else, but it's Jesus Christ alone. Well, We, we all know, everybody has quoted it uh, many, many times. I am the way. There is no other way except the Lord Jesus uh, Christ. We all know that. But turn in your Bible now to John chapter uh, 7. Here's a, a beautiful Bible illustration of this last invitation in the Bible. And it's in John chapter 7, and we read here in verse 37. And the Bible says, in the last day, the great day of the feast. Now, what he's talking about there is the feast of tabernacles, when they would live in the booths to remind them of the wilderness journey in the Old Testament uh, days before they entered the promised land. So the Bible says, um, in John 7, uh, 37, in the last day, the great day of the feast, Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus stood and he cried saying, if any man thirst, say, uh, if you're looking for meaning and purpose in life, if you uh, are looking for what life is all about, he says, if any man thirst, let him come unto uh, me, and drink. Now, and the Bible says in verse 38, He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall uh, flow rivers of living uh, uh, water. Now, and of course, that refers to the satisfaction that Jesus Christ gives. Now, this is very interesting as you study the Bible, because when they would observe the Feast of the Tabernacle, uh, uh, or the, the, uh, uh, the Feast of the uh, tabernacle, uh, uh, they're reminding them of the Old Testament uh, wilderness, that Feast of Tabernacles. See, what the priest would do on that feast day, he would take a golden pitcher of water and he would pour out that golden pitcher, pitcher of water on the altar. See, and that was one of the ways they celebrated, uh, you see, the Feast of Tabernacles. It was where he'd take the golden pitcher full of water and pour it out on 
of the altar. Now, see, Jesus was there, and Jesus stood up, and he said, if any man thirst, if you're looking for meaning and satisfaction and forgiveness in life, come unto me. I am the water of life. I am the one who can give you eternal life and abundant life and life with meaning. Now, when you read about that, that caused a big stir. As you read the following verses, we'll not uh, go into them, but it caused some people to look favorably upon Jesus, and they said, certainly he must be a prophet of God. Others rejected him. But now as you look down in John chapter 7, and uh, look down in verse 45. Now, see, right here, uh, in the ministry of Christ, they wanted to murder Jesus Christ at that time. You see, why? I am the water. There is no other way of salvation except through me. And if you want to find meaning and purpose in life, as well as forgiveness, you must come to me. Now, and he uttered those words, and now the religious people... See, the Pharisees, the pastors, the priests, the rabbis, they said, when they heard that, they said, let us arrest Jesus Christ. Let us put him in jail and try to get him crucified as soon as we can. Now, as you look now in John chapter 7 and verse 45, the Bible says, then came the officers to the chief priest, and Pharisees. See, these were the religious leaders of the day. They were the pastors. They were the priests. They were the rabbis. They were the re uh, religious leaders, see. And um, so the Bible says, and they said unto them, verse 45, John 7, uh, why have ye not brought him? And they said, now we told you soldiers to go and arrest Jesus Christ. See, we want to uh, put him in jail. We want to crucify him. See, that didn't start uh, at the end of his ministry. The first sermon Jesus Christ preached in the synagogue at Na Nazareth, as a result of that, they wanted to murder Jesus Christ at the beginning of his ministry. Now here, um, he's preaching about the water of life, come unto me, you see, and, uh, and as he says very, uh, uh, very clearly, and drink, you see, come unto me and drink. Now, and, the, and so the soldiers, very interestingly, as you read about it in verse 45, it says, uh, they said unto him, uh, unto the soldiers there that were sent to arrest Jesus Christ at this time. This was before the cross, of course, uh, when they finally did arrest him. And um, the Bible says, why have ye not brought him? They said, we told you to go and arrest Jesus Christ and bring him to us so that uh, we ultimately can get rid of him. Now, the next verse says in verse uh, 46, and the officers answered. They said, never man spake like this man. See? And what those officers said, they said, we could not arrest him. We could not bring him to you because here you have that famous verse in the Bible, no man ever spake like this man. Now, this is very, very instructive as we uh, uh, study the Word of God. See, uh, never man spake like this man. Now, what were they saying? See, they heard what Jesus Christ said. This is very, very important. They, in their unsaved condition, got the message. They understood what Jesus said meant when he said there, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. In other words, I am the only one by coming to me and knowing me, that's the only way you can find meaning and satisfaction as well as forgiveness in life. And so they said, when we heard him say that, we could not arrest him because never in our lives did we ever hear Anybody ever speak like he uh, spoke? See what it says there. Never man spake like this man. Uh, verse uh, 46. Now, actually, when you study that out, that's very interesting. They said, we never heard anybody in our lives ever speak like Jesus Christ 
spoke. Now, if you take that literally, what are they saying? See, no man ever spoke like this man spoke. Now, in other words, were they saying, we really believe that he was God in the flesh, that he was God in human form? Why? Nobody, nobody ever spoke like him. No man. Were they saying we believe that he's of God? Or were they saying that we believe that he actually was God? Well, you see, they did say no man ever spoke like him. And that's why we did not arrest him. Because he said, you see, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and, um, and drink. The only way you can find meaning in life is through Jesus Christ. Now, that's the clear teaching of the Bible. Say, no matter where you go to quench your thirst, you will never quench your thirst apart from Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only person that can quench the thirst of uh, your life. In other words, say, true peace, meaning, purpose, and satisfaction can only be found in Jesus Christ. Now, this is not the only place where he said that. You remember he talked with the woman at the well. And remember what he said to the woman at the well in John chapter 4. He said that if you drink of this water, you will thirst again. You'll always be a thirsty person. You will never find satisfaction. Now, we know as we study the Word of God that um, what he was talking about was that uh, uh, she was looking in all the wrong places to find satisfaction. Now, number one, when you study John chapter 4, you find that she was a Samaritan, and she said, we worship in Mount Gerizim. See, in other words, I have a religion. Uh, she said, I I'm a religious person. But she never found satisfaction in her religion. You see, now another thing, she did not find satisfaction in sex. And in immorality. Why? The Bible says, see, and this is where Jesus put her, his finger on her sin. Jesus said to her, now, a lot of times we think about the loving Jesus, and now he's very, very loving, but he's uncompromising. He was a holy, spotless son of God. And so he asked the woman, he said, um, go bring your husband. Now, he said that to her. She didn't say that to him. And uh, then she lied. She lied, said, I don't have any husband. And then Jesus said to her, thou hast rightly said, he said, you have had five in the past. You've had five in the past. And then Jesus said, this man that you are now living with is not your husband. That's a tremendous verse for our society today. When people shack up together, they are sinning against God. That's a sin in the sight of God. There is such a thing as adultery and fornication according to the Bible. Now, most people do not believe that. Say, most people are living like the devil uh, in this area. But now you see what he was saying to this woman. Say, that has never satisfied you. Say, so you're going from one relationship to another, and now you're living in open sin and uh, you say, you have no satisfaction. Jesus said, you will always be a thirsty person unless you come uh, to me. Now, see, she had no satisfaction in life. And Jesus said, but if you drink, now this is what he said to the woman. This is Jesus Christ, not the pastor, but Jesus Christ, the word of God. He said, if you drink of me, you drink of the water that I give you, you'll never, never, never thirst again. You see, he's talking about the only way you can find satisfaction is by coming to me. And if you don't come to me, you'll never find satisfaction in your religion, your immorality, or whatever uh, you want to try uh, to quench your thirst in. See, he said, you will never thirst. Now, that's the promise of Jesus Christ. If you're here thirsty this morning, the only way that you can find satisfaction and purpose and meaning in life is through Jesus Christ, according to the very word of Jesus Christ. According to what Jesus said very, very uh, clearly in the word of God. See, I like that song because, see, later on, and this gets us right into Revelation 22 and verse 17. You remember what she said to the men of the city? 
See, remember the Bible says she's talked to Jesus, and, and I believe that's where she realized he was a divine son of God. I believe she received him as her Savior. And you remember uh, the story there? She left her water pot at the, uh, there at the well. She got so excited, and then the Bible says she ran into the uh, city, and uh, then she told, the Bible says, the men, not the women. She's a lot more popular with the men than the women. And so she told the men, come and see a man who told me all things ever I did. And in the sense that uh, he knows all about me, knows all, knows all about my sin, and he forgave me of my sin. You need to come and you need to hear him. But see, the word that she used is the word come. She said, come. And hear Jesus. Now, in other words, I listened to him. I heard him. But now I want you personally to come to Jesus Christ. And I want you to hear him personally. Say, I want you to hear uh, about him. And then later on, they said he is the Savior of the world. And the Bible teaches that many came to him and recognized him as the Savior of the world. I believe there uh, is a great song that summarizes her salvation. See, in coming to the water, she was thirsty, spiritually thirsty, and how that thirst was quenched in her life. See, all my life long I had panted for a drink from some cool spring that I hoped would quench the burning of the thirst I felt within. Hallelujah! I have found Him whom my soul so long has craved Jesus satisfies my longings. Through his blood, I now am saved. Feeding on the husk around me till my strength was almost gone. Long my soul for something better, only still to hunger on. Hallelujah, I have found him whom my soul has uh, so long has craved. Jesus satisfies my longings. Through his blood, I now am saved. Now, see, the Bible teaches that the only way to have our thirst quenched, you see, is by coming to and knowing in a personal way the Lord Jesus Christ. No other way to get that thirst quenched in my life as uh, uh, an individual. Now, for instance, uh, uh, we read about Solomon and the book of Ecclesiastes. That's what the book of Ecclesiastes is all about. Uh, it's a wonderful book in the Bible, a study, especially for the society in which we are living uh, today. And what uh, Solomon is saying in the book of Ecclesiastes, that I had it all, I had everything that anybody could ever desire, I had it all, and it does not satisfy. It's vanity, it's soap, bubble, uh, soap bubbles, it's, it's a, a, a bunch of foolishness, and it does not satisfy. Now, now, who was Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes who said that? Now, he was the richest man in the entire world. In other words, he had more possessions than anybody else. He's just not a rich guy. He was the richest in the world. And all of that money did not satisfy uh, him. And then uh, um, we think of the pleasures. Now, as you read the book of Ecclesiastes, it mentions that he had any pleasure that he wanted. You name it, any type of pleasure that he wanted, he could indulge in, and he says, none of those pleasures satisfied me. And by the way, when you study about Solomon, you see, he was never satisfied in those areas of pleasure. It never brought satisfaction uh, to his life. And then the matter of power. See, he was the most powerful man in the world at that particular time. See, Solomon, you talk about power, having power in the world, being a, a powerful person. See, that was Solomon. Say, well, if I only had that power, if I was only famous, then I would be satisfied. No, see, Solomon had all that, and he was not uh, satisfied. And then he had the prestige, you know, uh, and so forth. And none of those things satisfied him. You know, it's very interesting to study the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, we'll just mention 
uh, some of the things in the book of Ecclesiastes that Solomon tried and said there was no satisfaction in it. It did not satisfy me. I uh, did not find meaning and purpose in these things. Now, and everybody who tries these things knows that they don't bring the satisfaction. Now, uh, for instance, he mentions in the book of uh, Ecclesiastes that uh, he talks about wisdom and knowledge and education. And the Bible says he gave himself to that. He gave himself to wisdom and knowledge and education but then he found out that did not satisfy him. Many have found that same thing, that it doesn't, that's not the thing that brings real peace and satisfaction in your life. And then uh, uh, the Bible says he, he tried uh, pleasure, all kinds of pleasure, uh, whether it's drinking, sex, immorality, women. How many can tell me how many wives the Bible says he had? Yeah. Say, you can see, that, that never satisfied him, amen? Say, he didn't find his satisfaction in that type of a thing. Say, and uh, he had everything that anybody could desire and more, and it did not uh, satisfy him. The matter of drinking, he talks about the wine in uh, chapter 2 and verse 3, of how that didn't bring him satisfaction. How many people are trying to find satisfaction and meaning through the bottle, Amen through the booze. Well, I want to forget my, uh, my life, and uh, so I'll booze it up to try to forget everything. And uh, he tried that, didn't, keep, uh, didn't help him. And then uh, uh, he tried to keep busy and accomplish things, and he was uh, evidently uh, an architect, and he built some things that nobody else ever built. And you might say, well, if I built that immense building or I was a, a great architect, some of the greatest buildings at that time, that, see, that didn't bring him satisfaction at all. And yet it kept him busy, and he was very busy in accomplishing, quote, great uh, architectural uh, feats, but it never did satisfy him. See, it did not uh, satisfy him. And then the money, the wealth, the possessions, if anybody... Uh, condemns that and shows that that will never bring satisfaction, it's Solomon, because he mentions that over and over again in the book of uh, Ecclesiastes. And then it's very interesting, chapter 2 and verse 8, he talks there in the book of Ecclesiastes about music. Well, maybe I'll drown uh, this quenching my thirst in music. A lot of people do that today, amen? See, they try to find satisfaction in their music. Take a lot of these musicians and uh, they're multi-millionaires and, and uh, people go to the concerts and, and they, uh, well, they're trying, to, they're trying to find meaning and they're trying to find satisfaction. But Solomon said, you cannot find meaning and satisfaction in music. Isn't that interesting? See, it's amazing when uh, you, you study the Bible. We heard about the uh, big concert down in Houston the other day. And um, how many was there? Nine people that were trampled to death uh, in, uh, in relation to that concert down there in uh, Houston. And the sad thing about it, I heard there was a, a, a young child. A young child was trampled to death. And what were they going to hear? See, music to satisfy themselves. The result of it, uh, even uh, one of the nine was a little uh, boy, I believe, or a little girl that got uh, uh, trampled to death. Now, see, what we're saying is the Bible is very, very clear. See, you can only find satisfaction, according to the Bible, in knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior. He is the only one who can quench that thirst in your life. Now, that is what he said. He said to the woman at the well, now, if you drink uh, of this water, you'll always thirst. But he said, if you drink of the water that I give you, see, he used that word, never. You'll never thirst. See, if you take the water that I want to give you, and that's the water of salvation uh, through uh, him. Now, uh, in our uh, society today, and the reason why I want to bring this home, say, the only way, say, the last invitation of the Bible, Revelation twenty two seventeen, 17, the only way you can quench your thirst is by coming to Jesus Christ 
and knowing him. How many people in our society today and the mental health experts tell us that suicide is on the increase in the state of New Jersey and throughout America. Now, they blame it on the coronavirus. See, they say everybody is cooped up in that type of thing. They're depressed and one thing uh, or another. And, and a lot of people uh, are committing suicide. And not only teenagers, young people, college students, but children. Suicide amongst children is uh, on the increase in the state of New Jersey. And I believe the health experts said that it is an epidemic. Children's suicide in the state in which we live right here. Now, um, you see, people are thirsty, but the only way they can quench their thirst is by coming to Jesus Christ. I have a note here. It's a suicide note by a very famous person. They're very, very famous. They're at the top of their particular uh, profession and this is the suicide note he left before he committed suicide. He said, I have had few difficulties in life. I've had many friends, great successes, and I've gone from wife to wife, from house to house, visited the great countries of the world, but am fed up with inventing devices to fill up 24 hours a day, and he committed suicide. That was a suicide note that he left. See, he had everything, but he really had nothing, amen? See, and that's what Jesus said. See, you'll never quench your thirst in the things of this world. It is an impossibility, no question about that uh, what, uh, whatsoever. And how many have uh, found that out? You think of uh, Cecil Rhodes, that was... Uh, the man that uh, controlled the diamond industry and found all those diamonds down in uh, Rhodesia, uh, had a country named after him down there in South Africa, and since then they changed the name of uh, Rhodesia to Zimbabwe. And, uh, but it used to be called Rhodesia down there in South uh, Africa. He controlled the diamond industry of the world. He was one of the most uh, richest people in the world, controlled the diamond industry of the world, and uh, before he died, he called into a faithful missionary that was serving God in South Africa. And he said, I want to talk to you. I, I need to talk to you. And um, he said to the missionary, he said, you have a legacy. He said, you came to South Africa. You preached the gospel. You started churches. Everybody respects you uh, in a sense that you have done a wonderful job here preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. But he said, I have no legacy. He said, when I die, what am I going to leave behind? The diamond mines? So what? A country is called after my name. He said, I have no legacy. He said, I have no meaning and no purpose in life. Now, by the way, that's the Rhodes Scholarship. You hear about the Rhodes Scholarships and so forth, that was Cecil Rose, that he left um, uh, several million dollars when he died of that diamond money to try to have a legacy so that people would remember him, you see, and uh, uh, so forth. But then it's very interesting because he was riding a train one day and he came in contact with William Booth. Now, William Booth was the founder of the Salvation Army. And uh, he saw Cecil Rhodes there, and he said, he said, Mr. Rhodes, are you a satisfied man? Now, here's one of the richest men in the world. See, all that diamond industry, I think, all goes back to him. De, -Bear, De Bears diamonds and all that over in Belgium. But um, he said to William Booth, he said, I am a miserable man. I have no peace. I am a miserable man. Now, who was that? There was somebody who was at the top of the world, so to speak. And he said, I have no 
peace, and happiness. He said to William Booth, founder of the uh, Salvation, Army, uh, uh, Salvation Army, I am a miserable man. Say, you can only quench your thirst by knowing Jesus Christ and being saved and knowing Jesus Christ. He's the only one that can quench your, your thirst. Um, we heard on the news this past week, 128,000 people this, so far this year have died of drug overdoses in America. It's up 30% over last year. It's up 30%. Now, so far this year, 128,000 people have died in America, the United States of America, as a result of drug overdoses, especially this fentanyl, and uh, which they tell us, somebody said it's either 100 times or a thousand times, I'm not sure, somebody have checked me out on this, but it's either a hundred or a thousand times more deadly than heroin. Say, a hundred or a thousand times more deadly than heroin. Now, say 128,000 people have died last year in the United States of America. That's the country in which we live, you know, right here. You see, and... Uh, up 30% over last year. Now, why do people get involved in that type of a thing? They're thirsty. I need a high. Uh, uh, I need to be happy. I need something. Uh, say, I'm dry, I'm dusty, I, uh, I'm thirsty. I, I have no meaning, I have no purpose in life. And so they get involved in that demonic drug uh, business. And 128,000, and many of them young people, see, in America that have died. See, they're searching to get their thirst quenched, and they can't get it quenched. Now, see, the world has no answer to these things. Only Jesus Christ is the answer. That's why over and over again, we want to emphasize Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. He's the way of salvation. He's the only way that you can be saved. And see, it's only through Him. Jesus said, you want your thirst quenched? You come to me, and if you do not get, come to me, Jesus said, you'll never quench that thirst. Oh, yes, I'll quench my thirst by watching pornography on the Internet. No, you just become an addict. You'll become a slave. You're not going to find... Uh, your satisfaction in that. Now, here's a sad thing. I heard this uh, expert interviewed this past week. That's why I know the 128,000 died. And uh, he was an expert uh, in this area of drugs in America, drug addiction and all that type thing. I don't know if he's a professor or what at a university. But they asked him the question. They said, how can we solve the problem of drug addiction in America? Now, this was like number one expert in the field. And you know what he said? He said, it will never be solved. He said, look what's going on. Look at all the money our government spends. Look what's going on in our country. Up 30% over last year, the deaths caused by the drugs, it's up 30%. He said, it will never, ever be solved. More people will die of drugs than ever before. It'll always be on the increase. Now, here's the interesting thing. He said, the reason for that is there's too much money involved in it. Too many people are making too much money. And they're not going to, uh, see, they have this quest for money. And he said, as a result of that, and he's an expert, he said, it will never be solved in the United States of America because there is too much money involved in drugs and the drug trade, you see. And, uh, but you see, people are thirsty, but they're never going to find and get that qu thirst quenched until they come to know Jesus Christ. Jeremiah 2.13, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken 
the fountain of living waters. Jeremiah says, you turned your back on me. And then in Jeremiah 2.13, he says, you've forsaken the fountain of living waters and have hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Say, and you're trying to satisfy uh, all this thirst in your life, so you build a cistern. That's that thing where, like a pool, where they uh, store the water. And he said, your problem is your cisterns have holes in them. You can never be satisfied by what you're trying to do and how you're trying to satisfy uh, uh, yourself. Now, see, what we're talking about is the last invitation of the Bible. You see how pertinent it is? You see how practical uh, the Bible is? In Revelation chapter 22 and verse uh, 17. Now, we have that word, come, 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 come. Again, that's an urgent invitation. God is saying, don't think about it. You come and come right now. Today is the day to be saved. Don't put this off. Say it's an imperative, but it's an entreaty. God cannot force you to come. God cannot force anybody to come to Jesus in uh, salvation. But, you see, here's a beautiful thing in the Bible. He is pleading. That's the last invitation of the Bible. Does God want me to be saved? God is pleading with you to be saved. God wants you to be saved. That's the plea of God. That's the plea of the church. That's the plea of the Holy Spirit. That's the plea of every child of God. That you would come to Jesus Christ, to have your thirst uh, uh, quenched. Now, see, the beautiful thing here in Revelation 22 and verse 17 is that there's no hidden message here. There's no disclaimer. There's no hook. Uh, there's no, nothing there uh, to trick you. Why? Because, see, the Bible says it's free. And it is free. See, there's no hooks. There's no catches here. There, in other words, like I've said so many times, when you read study the Bible, see, there's no hidden meaning. There's no uh, secret meaning behind it. See, what it is, very clear. You see, um, there's no hidden meaning here. Now, almost everything in our world is deceptive. If somebody wants to make a million dollars, I'm going to tell you how to make a million dollars. Write a book on false advertising. And if you write a book on false advertising, you have to get gift to write. You will uh, write a bestseller and you will make uh, a lot of uh, money. Because, see, there's a lot of dishonesty and deception in advertising. By the way, you listen to anything on radio, television, whatever, wherever you get your news, and they have the commercial come on. And then you have, you always have the disclaimer. See, the disclaimer. Well, uh, people made 20% off this uh, investment. You see, uh, and, uh, and if you invest with us, uh, you may, they always use the word may, uh, make 20%. But now here, here's the catch. You say, but past performance is no indication of what it's going to do today. See, that's what is that? See, it's a disclaimer. And uh, we, ha we have that in so much. Uh, see, and uh, see, there's so much. I'm serious. Somebody ought to write a book on false advertising. See, and just go get all the commercials and see all the disclaimers and uh, you see uh, all the deceptions and uh, the dishonesty in advertising in America today. Now, I'm not going into a lot of detail, but I know of someone who's involved in a major retailer in America today. And I asked him, I said, in your store, and don't ask me who it is or what store it is, because I'll not tell you, because I said, well, in your store, are they really bargains on Black Friday? Now, it's a major retailer, a major retailer, and because they're in the know, they say, no, we import 
all kinds of inferior things in our store that we sell only on Black Friday. We don't sell them any other time of the year. See, uh, we get them in. And uh, here, here's what he said, a very interesting thing. Well, they, they said to me, they said, uh, always check the serial numbers. Because he said a lot of this that is inferior equipment that is brought into our store to be sold on Black Friday, if you check the serial number, it's similar to the upgraded thing, but it's different. It's a different serial number. In other words, so you think you're getting that upgraded thing that you heard about, and uh, uh, it's such a, a bargain, but he said, uh, check the serial numbers. And he said, but that's what he told me. Now, now what I'm saying, see, that's deceptive, amen? See, that's deceptive. Now, if you're going to sell junk, say it's junk, amen? You know, if it's uh, cheap stuff, say, hey, we got a bunch of cheap stuff here from China, and we're going to sell it. And, uh, but you see, he said they only sell that stuff on Black Friday. They never sell it any other time of the year. You come in that store and you want to buy something, no, uh, see, you can't buy that stuff, see, because it's inferior stuff. Now, see, the world is full of deception. See, the world is full of uh, people deceiving one another. Now, what I'm saying, this salvation verse in the Bible has no disclaimers. See, there's no deception here. When God says something, that's it, amen? It's true. See, uh, uh, there's no disclaimers. There's no hooks. Uh, there's no hidden meaning. He says, come. And if you come to Jesus you will have your thirst uh, quenched. And um, thank the Lord that it's absolutely free because Jesus said it's free. The Word of God says it's free. Come and take of the water of life, but it says it's free, freely. Salvation is a free gift. Isn't that wonderful that it is a free gift? But how many churches... Preach that it's by our works, it's by our goodness, it's by our giving money, and all this type. And by the way, how many evangelical Christians are involved in these organizations in money and money making and all that kind of uh, business? But see, you get the, uh, the thirst quenched freely by coming to Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now, I, I just uh, want to mention this. Uh, you see, when we're studying about heaven... In the Bible, what we uh, many times leave out is, say, this is a great teaching in the Bible about the holiness of God. Say, God is a holy God. Say, the only people who will go to heaven are those who have come to Jesus Christ and received him as Savior. No question about that. The Gospel of John teaches that from beginning to end of the Gospel uh, of John. But now, see, we think of the, how do we learn about the holiness of God? And a lot of times, say, we don't uh, equate Bible doctrine with Bible teaching. Say, now, see, one of the great, many have believed that the greatest characteristic of God is that God is a holy God. And boy, that's neglected today. Say, who teaches about the holiness of God? That God is a holy God. Say, and that is why not everybody is going to go to heaven someday. See, only those who have been de declared righteous and holy in the sight of God, praise God, can go to heaven. And that only can take place in our lives by applying the blood of Jesus Christ to our uh, lives. For instance, turn uh, over to Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8. Now, that's what we're dealing with last week. And see, it says, but the fearful. Now, see, in the first seven verses, he's talking about heaven and the glories of heaven. That's where you're reading the Bible. No more sorrow, no more tears, no more pain. See, that's heaven. And God will dwell with us. That's heaven. But then in Revelation 21, verse 8, but the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, and the murderers and whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. 
uh, again, we pointed out, that's eternal hell. But he said, see, but the fearful, the unbelieving. Now, see, in the same passage, the most detailed passage in your Bible about heaven, God tells us not everybody's going to go to heaven. And he tells you specifically those who will not go to heaven. First on the list is, uh, as it says there, the fearful. We point that out last week. That's the cowards. Now look at Revelation 21 and verse 27. And there shall in no wise enter into it. That's talking about heaven, the eternal state. Is everybody going to go to heaven? See, this is in the context of heaven. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, maketh a lie, but they that are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, circle those words, no wise. If you want a good translation of that, put in your Bible, impossible. See, that is a double negative in your Bible. And that, in other words, that's the strongest way in the, uh, in the text and in the original language that you can express a negative. There is no more powerful way in the Bible that you can express a negative. Now, you see what it says? And there shall in no wise, say, in no wise enter. In no wise, and in other words, it's an impossibility for unsaved people ever go to heaven. Only people go to heaven are they, those that have been cleansed of their sin through the blood of Christ have come to him to get that, that their uh, thirst quenched. And then look at Revelation 22 and verse 15. Now, the reason why I bring this out, see, this shows us the holiness of God. All of these verses are in the context of the eternal state in the future of heaven. Now here's the third time in Revelation 22 and verse 15. For without, see those that are not in heaven, those who will not go to heaven are dogs. And by the way, it's not talking about uh, a phys you know, a regular dog. It's talking about people who act like dogs. See, people who believe in work salvation and other things like that. But uh, it says, and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters. And you see what it says there? Whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. You see, that's interesting. But it says without. Now, now, what are we pointing out? Say, here we learn about heaven, the most detailed passage in the Bible about heaven, and there are three different times that God says it's impossible for anybody to go to heaven if they have not come to Jesus Christ and got that uh, thirst quenched in their life. Say, without. Now, what does that mean? Say, God is a holy God. Do you ever think about it? Say, in the context now, in the Word of God, say, God is a holy God. Say, why? Not everybody is going to go to heaven. Why? Say, God only allows perfect people to go to heaven. And we can only be made perfect by what Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary. Say, you and I have the righteousness of Christ. We've had our sins washed away. See, we're clean in the sight of God. And that's the only person, see, and that was because he paid that price on the cross, amen? He shed his blood. He died for my sin. He died for your sin so we could be forgiven of our sin. That's God's holiness displayed on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, see, God is a holy God. Nobody goes to heaven unless they have been washed and made clean in the blood of Jesus Christ. In other words, unless they've come to him and got that thirst quenched in their life. Now, you see, what we're talking about now is Bible doctrine. See, and when you think about the holiness of God, that helps us understand who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. Amen? 
Say, God is a holy God. And that is something that I don't think anybody preaches. Did you ever hear anybody preach about heaven and the holiness of God? See, only those who have been made perfect through Jesus Christ can go to heaven someday. You see, that's the only person. You have to come to Him. You have to receive His righteousness. You have to receive His cleansing and His uh, forgiveness. See, uh, some might say, well, I'm a good person. And I believe I'll get to heaven someday. See, no good people go to heaven. Only saved people go to heaven. You, you say, well, I gave a million dollars to the church. And so I believe that's going to help me at that great judgment day. No, see, your money can't get you in. It's free. Salvation is free. It's through Jesus Christ. And it's only through him alone. Say, come to me. Say, whosoever will, anybody that has a desire, let him come to Jesus Christ. And the Bible is uh, very, very uh, uh, clear in Revelation 22, 17. Come and let him that is a thirst come and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. So you say, you can't preach on heaven without preaching on the holiness of God. It's a holy place, and only those who have been made holy through Jesus Christ will ever go to heaven. That's our position in Jesus Christ. And uh, why will all unsaved people go to hell? Because God is a holy God. That's why people will go to hell. John Wesley was uh, the founder of the Methodist Church, but he was a great evangelist. And if he were living today, we'd be glad to have him come preach in our church. Uh, but uh, John Wesley uh, said he had a dream one night. He was the founder of the Methodist Church. And he said he went up to the gatekeeper in or down in hell. This is John Wesley. And uh, he said, I asked the gatekeeper, how many, are there any Methodists in hell? And the gatekeeper of hell said, there's a lot of Methodists in hell. There's a lot of your people in hell. And then uh, he said, well, how many Episcopalians are in hell? And the gatekeeper said, there's a lot of Episcopalians in hell. And then he said, well, said, of all the people, how about the Baptist? He said, how many Baptists are in hell? And uh, the gatekeeper said, there's a lot of Baptists in hell. How about Roman Catholics? He said, there's a lot of Roman Catholics in hell. So then um, he went to the gatekeeper of heaven. And he asked the gatekeeper of heaven, this is John Wesley, and uh, this was his dream, you know. And he said, I asked the great keeper, gatekeeper of heaven, and he said, uh, how many Methodists are in heaven? And the gatekeeper said, there's no Methodist in heaven. Not one of your people are in heaven. Not, not, not one Methodist is in heaven. He said, well, how about the Episcopalians? And uh, the gatekeeper of heaven said, there's not one Episcopalian in heaven. And then uh, he said, well, how about the Roman Catholics? He said, there's not one Roman Catholic in heaven. And then he said, well, how about the Baptist? And the gatekeeper of heaven said, there's not one Baptist in heaven. He said, the only people in heaven are those who have been washed and made clean in the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Say, that's who is in heaven. Those who have been washed, made clean in the blood of Jesus Christ. Say, that's the only people who go to heaven. Say, are those who are saved, those who are washed from their sins in his own blood. Praise God for it. Say, here you have the last invitation of the Bible, and you see how God is reaching out, how God loves man, how God wants to save people, how God is concerned for the salvation. He says, come, 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 come. I want you to come. And that's the way you'll get your thirst quenched, and that's the way... Uh, you'll get salvation is through me. See, the water of life, the one who will quench your thirst, save your soul, forgive you of your sin, and it's free, but you have to come. You have to make that decision to come to Christ. 
And uh, uh, so if you haven't made it, you need to make it. You say, well, uh, I've always been a good person. Uh, I've always believed in Christ. No, uh, no people who have always been good go to heaven. No people who say, I've always believed in Christ. Because, you see, we didn't have time to get into it this morning. But see, that text means you come only one time. You don't come twice. You don't come. See, what it's talking about is a tense here of salvation. You come one time and he takes care of it. He forgives you of all of your sins. But you have to come. Say, and uh, that one time, have you come? You say, well, uh, I pray every day that Jesus would forgive me of my sins. Well, you're not saved because you don't realize that his blood was shed to forgive you of all of your sins. If you're saved, you know your sins are forgiven. Not because we deserve it, but that's by His grace and mercy. So if you're not saved, you need to be saved. Let's bow our heads and our hearts in prayer. And as our heads are bowed and as our eyes are closed, is there someone, even this morning, and you say, Pastor, I am not sure whether I'm saved or not. Pastor, I'm not sure about it. But I want to be sure. Raise your hand. You say, Pastor, that's me. I've been seeking all my life to have the thirst quenched. It's never been quenched, but I realized this morning, if I come to Jesus Christ, I will have the thirst quenched. I will have salvation. I will have forgiveness. He'll give me meaning and purpose in life. That's his promise to you. You say, Pastor, I want to be honest with God this morning. I need salvation. I need to be saved. I need to come. I need to answer the call to come to Jesus for salvation this morning. And you say, Pastor, that's me. I don't want to fool around. I don't want to make excuses. I realize this morning is my time when of my own volition, I want to come to Jesus Christ to forgive me of my sin. Your hand say, Pastor, pray for me. I am not sure I'm saved. I'm not sure if I die today, I go to heaven. Pastor, would you pray for me that I'd be saved and come to know the Lord as my Savior? Our Father, speak to our hearts, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.